We're at the beginning of an, um, of an explosion of social science genetics research and we're at the juncture where it's really important to make some critical um, decisions about what sort of methodological approaches to follow. And, um, and in particular the two sort of leading methodologies that, um, that have been used in the literature on, candidate gene on, on, on genetic associations um, discover, require very different research infrastructure. So as most of you already know, there are two types, two sort of basic approaches. These candidate gene studies in which you specify some exanta hypotheses um, about some small s number of SNPs, um, and GWAS in which, in which you sort of atheoretically test a large number of genetic markers for association. So, so my talk is going to be, so my, my talk is going to, sort of, Phil and Dan are going to come after me. They're, they're, um, their talks are going to build off of mine. So what I would propose is that we sort of we suspend discussion until after Phil's talk and we just keep make the discussion a little longer. But, but I'm also happy to sort of take clarifying questions as we go along or, or after my talk if you think it's called for. So my message is going to be um, that, um, that a lot of these existing candidate approaches as practiced today are not working very well. So, so in many ways my... my um, my remarks are going to echo those made in the, uh, in the previous session. Dan will sort of explain that there is a single principle that can help us understand why this is. Um, and Phil's talk is going to hopefully persuade you that, it, that if we take these challenges seriously, you can actually um, um, produce results that, that replicate very consistently. So candidate gene approaches, as you know, are, are based on a sort of research design where you specify some modest number of hypotheses, ideally choose a significance threshold equal to the sort of Bonferroni corrected 5% level, um, and it has a lot of appeal, um, in my experience, to, to, to economists because we're sort of used to thinking in terms of uh, hypothesis-based research. Now, in practice, these results um, often fail to replicate. Um, to, towards the end of my talk, I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'll give an illustration of the one major reason, I think, for the um, for the failure of these sorts of results to replicate. Um, um, some of these, some of these ca things came up in the previous session, and Dan will sort of build, build off of that. Um, and the example I'll give, it, th and the, sort of the, the challenge that I'll um, illustrate is the challenge of, of population stratification. In the GWAS study, um, the um, GWAS study uses a theoretically test, as you know, a very large number of markers. Um, these days, usually two million or so. Because of the large um, number of statistical hypotheses tested, um, a very sort of stringent significance threshold is required. And GWAS has some sort of non-obvious advantages, one of them being that the, this hypothesis-free design actually makes the need to correct for hypo multiple hypotheses um, testing more transparent. Um, and another one, and I think that tends to be less emphasized, is that if you have a, a dense SNP data, it actually makes it a lot easier to control for, so for what's called um, uh, population stratification. That is the tendency for, for some genetic variants to vary, to, to, for their frequency to correlate with environmental compounds. Okay, so, so we originally, as, as most people, started off, in, started off in the world of candidate gene studies. And let me just tell you about one of them that I think is sort of illustrative of a more general pattern in this, in this literature. So this is work the lead author is Chris Chabri, um, and it was an attempt to sort of systematically replicate uh, candidate gene associations with, uh, with general intelligence. So what did Chris and co-authors do? Well, we selected a bunch of SNPs from a, from a published review article, and then we tried to replicate associations between 12 genetic variants mentioned in this article um, and G in, in three different samples, so a Swedish sample, um, and two U.S. samples. Um, in none of these samples were we able to replicate any of the associations reported in the literature, and moreover, we were sort of unable to reject the null hypothesis that the SNPs jointly uh, had any explanatory power for G. So if you just do the F test of the 12 SNPs jointly, to fail, reject, fail to reject the null that they have any ex explanatory power. Here is, um, here's what you get if you just pool the coefficients from across the three studies. This is with um, intelligence standardized, sort of following the convention of standardizing it so, so, that, so, so that its standard deviation is equal to 15. And as you can see, we, we, um, the confidence intervals are pretty tight. We can usually rule out effects larger than, say, 1 one fifteenth of an IQ point, something like that. 
Okay, so this is just one of many, many examples of how um, initially promising findings often, often fail to replicate, unless you think that, this is, that it's just us uh, saying these things, it's this sort of increasing recognition of these problems in the literature. So here is, here's an editorial statement from, um, um, from the leading field journal um, written by John Hewitt, its editor, um, in which he s states quite, uh, um, <laughs> in, in, in which he um, um, makes it pretty clear that he's sort of dissatisfied with the state of the literature, saying that, uh, that the candidate gene literature is full of reports that haven't rigorously replicated. So, so um, um, we're going to have more to say about that during, during Dan's talk. What I want to do now is switch gears a little bit and sort of start, start to try to understand um, why that is. And one contributing factor is the problem of, of, of population stratification that I already mentioned. It turns out that many of the um, genetic variants studied in these candidate gene studies are differentiated, have different frequencies of, across population populations and unless you do a really careful job controlling for confounding variables there there's a risk of, of just picking up spurious associations um, and as I mentioned earlier with, with these rich SNP data it's fairly straightforward to um, to estimate to, to estimate the genetic covariance matrix of the genotypic data and then from that um, matrix extract a couple of principal components and use those as controls and it turns out that those controls um, um, do a surprisingly good job um, accounting for these confounds. So let me just give you one simple example um, of this. Um, so this arose during the course of some of, of revision we did for a for a journal. Um, our reviewer was a methodologist, but not one who um, was sort of accustomed to uh, genetic research. Um, so he sort of asked for an illustration of how these PCs operate in, in practice. So what are we doing here? Well, we're taking a SNP from the gene LCT, which is known to be um, differentiated even within Europe, um, and it's an important and it's a major cause of lactose intolerance. There's absolutely no reason to think that it would be associated with educational attainment. Then we took data from the HRS, so that's a major US social science survey um, whose respondents were recently genotyped, and then we just ran the regression of um, um, of educational attainment on, on this genetic variant, okay? And what you get is a coefficient of something like one half, meaning that for each reference allele is associated with one half, half a year of, edu of educational attainment. Um, and th that, of course, would be uh, quite shocking if it were true. Uh, it's not true. It turns out to be entirely an artifact of, of stratification. Now, the first point that's important, I think, um, to make is that just controlling for a person's self-identified race does not eliminate stratification. That's what this second um, um, bar shows. Uh, it roughly cuts the coefficient in half. Um, whereas adding two PCs seems sort of sufficient, at least in this example, of course, it's going to be population specific. But in this example, adding two PCs is enough to eliminate what is almost surely a, a spurious association. Um, Second thing, second point I'll make is that nor is it, nor is it sufficient, and you know, the reason I mention this is that it's quite common, in what one often sees claims, um, claims like we controlled for ancestry by, by including these indicator variables for, for uh, self, you know, racial self-classification, um, and it's, a, it's just a misconception that those sorts of indicator variables are, are an effective guard against um, this problem. Um, here is a similar figure, but just showing what happens if you restrict the sample to people who identify as whites. Again, there's a very strong um, relationship in the absence of any controls. Once you control for the first two um, principal components, um, the association goes away. Okay. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Dan, uh, unless there are sort of specific questions. Um <laughs>